What's good, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. And like always, the J. David Group, which is my company, is sponsoring this podcast. We help today's teams build the next generation of unicorns. This podcast is also now being sponsored by Allego. For all you sales leaders out there, have you ever absolutely nailed sales training or had a rep who killed a presentation that you wished you recorded to be seen later by new hires or other members of the team? Well, that's just one of the things that a Lego can do. Not only does it allow you to record your best content for practice, collaboration, and feedback, but it gives you a way to organize all of your best content in one place so it's easily accessible to help improve sales performance for everyone. Uh, email me, web with two Bs, at thejdavidgroup.com so I can personally introduce you to someone who will take great care of you. Now, my guest today is Bershu Kwawia, a sales leader at Honeywell Connected Devices, enabling enterprises to grow through digital transformation. But one of the reasons I wanted to have him on was because of his journey earlier in his career from that took him from engineer to VP of sales, which in and of itself is just really unique, especially here for Over Quota. Bershu, welcome to Over Quota. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Very happy to be here. So before I get into what I just alluded to about that journey, I have a question just because, you know, you you do have an engineering background. And to me, engineers as salespeople are always fascinating and sales leaders are always fascinating to me for many, many different reasons, in particular, uh, sales process. So when you are looking to solve a big challenge, let's say it's or maybe in the past you've solved a big challenge from going from you needed to take the sales cycle, let's say down from 12 months to six months, or just shorten it in some way, right? Or change something in a sales process or attack a new market. Like how do you go about solving big challenges? Um, and, and coming from an engineer's mind, I'm, I'm particularly curious about that. Jay, yeah, one of the things that we're seeing nowadays in sales, of course, is the systematic right? You build a certain cadence and you follow that cadence in order to get to the close. Mm -hmm. Uh, By training, that's how engineers work and that's how they think. Engineering really forces you to do things a step by step. You do things with the end goal in mind um, analytically. And so the transition from engineer to sales, I think is actually a natural one. So if I'm if, I, if I'm going to be able to reduce a cell cycle, um, it doesn't take much than to do the logical thing, look at the key steps in between where I am now and where I want to be and target those key steps, knowing that in between there are going to be things that I have to change. Uh, I may have to change to get to where I really want to go. And then how do you do that? How do you, when you want to change something, um, what does that look like um, in there? And how do you go about when you say those steps that are in the sales process? So you look at, let's say, for instance, a 12-step sales process, however long the, the sales process is, you, you'll look at that, see what can be changed, and then go about changing it. And then if that's the case, what's your approach to that? What's your uh, process for actually changing what needs to be changed? Mm. I guess the first step is realizing that uh, if I go with your example of a 12-step process, Mm -hmm. is that no process is cast in stone, that each and every process remains agile. Mm -hmm. So in one case, that 12-step process is really going to be a 12-step process. Mm -hmm. In other cases, that 12-step process could very well become a 10-step or a 13-step process, depending on the stakeholders are involved, depending on the state where we find ourselves in the cell. What I'm saying is when it when push comes to shove, you look again at the situation, where am I? Where am I going? Who is involved? What relationship do I have with those people? How can I influence them or can I? Is there somebody else outside that may be able to drive that? And depending on what the answers are, you might very well short circuit some of those. Now, generally, what I've found to work for me is that when you, when I'm running a sales process, there are two areas that I'm looking keenly at. One of them is the internal stakeholders, 
right? Who are the internal stakeholders that can make this easy for me? I.e., define the ROI or calculate the ROI, prepare those slides. Uh, if there is a product design engineering that has to happen, do I have that backing? Do we have enough information to sell that? So you take care of that. Sometimes early enough, uh, you will be able to accelerate the sale. Right now, this of course also includes the process because sometimes you bury your head so much in the sun going after the sale that you forget that you need to create that you need to create that account in the system in the ERP to be to begin with, and all of a sudden you have the sale and you don't have a customer to book that sale against. You can't even accept it. The second area to look at is on the customer side, right? Um, my approach to sales in general, regardless of what it is that I'm selling, whether it has been hardware or software, is to realize that the customer is not buying anything because they are so excited about whatever it is I'm selling. They are buying it because they have a problem to solve. And so it is my duty to get to understand the customer's problem, to get to understand their business, understand what they are doing that. And uh, Keenan says that very good in, in gap selling, which he says no problem, no sell. So, and once I realize that and I'm able to articulate the value to the customer, that sort of brings some sense of urgency. And it, when does data come into decision making as you're looking at, you know, you're looking at the steps in the sales process, you're looking at the stakeholders who are involved and you know, again, maybe this mandate or task with shortening the sales process is is, is something that, um, you know, obviously it's, it's important. How much are you looking at the data within all of that to say, um, you know, it, it, it's informing you to make one decision over another uh, yeah. and so forth? Now, that, I think data always plays a role. And mm -hmm. data played a role long before we have all of these analytics that we, that we have now. Uh, the question is, how deep do you go into the data? Some people are very fortunate to have the analytics that spit out something and say, these are the deals you need to focus on. On this stage of the deals, we suggest you do this. I have not had that. I haven't had that luxury. So I've had to look at the customer and uh, analyze, look back into the business to say, what, it is, what have we done with this customer before? What have we done with similar customers? What happened? What was it that made them bite? And if I'm then able to translate those learnings to where I am now, great. But more importantly, since I mentioned earlier that we are talking to the customer about their business and how uh, we can help them address the challenges that they are facing, it is of course critical that we are able to demonstrate that we have done something similar elsewhere, right? That we have solved similar problems and to really uh, prove that you are not just blowing hot air, that there is really some substance behind the promises that you are doing. Keeping in mind quite often as well that whoever it is that you have as a customer on the other end uh, has other stakeholders that they have to satis satisfy. So they have goals and metrics and aligning yourself with those goals and metrics is, is very, very important. In some cases, you actually there are customers that will openly tell you <laughs> Uh, this is what I need to meet, and these are some of the KPIs that I need to fulfill, right? If you are in that lucky position, then you can easily align your past successes with those uh, targeted KPIs. Right, because on their end, they are making a decision to solve a problem, and that problem um, obviously um, could enable them to, you know, look really good for their boss, get promoted and all those things. So if your KPIs are aligned with what their KPIs are, then obviously the better. Exactly. Quite often in sales, we talk a lot about the products, right? I'm going to sell you the software. This software does X, Y, Z. For the customer, as I said, the customer doesn't care that there is software. The customer has a problem of productivity. Mm -hmm. They have a problem of the bottom line. They want to increase profitability. They want to grow their profit level by two points, for example, and that's all they care. And there are different ways of doing that as well. Quite often you can do that with software. Uh, sometimes you can do that by simply reorganizing the team and so on and so forth. And which is why it's, uh, you, you can't just bring the software. The customer doesn't know what software is. All they know is I am now at uh, eight points and I'm being told to 
deliver productivity, a two-digit productivity. So I need to go at least to 10, right? And if software is the way to do it, then we have to be able to articulate that in the language that the customer understands, right? And be able to demonstrate that we have done that so that uh, uh, they, they can identify with themselves with what it is that we're talking about. Back to what I was saying earlier regarding that journey from engineer to uh, VP of sales. Tell me about that. Tell me how you were, what, what, what that journey was like and, and how you made the transition because it seems like it's, to your point, it's, uh, it, there's natural uh, congruency between the two, but look from the outside looking in, it doesn't, it might not look that way. There, there, there are two things that uh, led me in that journey. One of them is, like you say, it's the engineering training. The other one is simply a natural sense of curiosity, mm -hmm. right? As an engineer, I get out of school and I go into design and I really love engineering. I'm designing pipelines and tank farms and connecting all types of things, pump stations and doing all the wonderful things to move oil mm -hmm. uh, from one area to another. So that was great. Right. But then I discover in that process that uh, in order to make to do that work, you had to talk to people, you had to talk to vendors, you had to talk to some other colleagues uh, in order to learn what was happening within the industry and to be able to determine you had to talk to regulators. Right. And the art of the whole idea of talking to people scared the crap out of me at first. <laughs> but once I started picking up the phone, I was hooked. Right, I realized the joy, my joy of doing work really came from talking to people. So that when the opportunity came, I said, how can I combine engineering, which I love, and uh, this new thing that I've discovered, which is talking to people is such a wonderful thing. <laughs> so the only thing I could think of was to go into applications, application engineering, mm -hmm. uh, which I did. I jumped into application engineering, or at least that's what I thought I was doing. It turned out that my employer at the time was really looking for an engineering head uh, that would at the same time run operations, right? So I jumped into that role and uh, took over that, also quickly realized that uh, they had quality management issues, which I appointed myself to go and solve. And that was a blast. So getting the customer, the company certified ISO 9001. And now by doing all of this, you, I end up with an end-to-end -end, uh, business experience where I'm running from, from selling, uh, a team that was doing selling, supporting sales, and uh, doing operations, doing services. And that really was awesome. But eventually, um, because you are responsible for the business, you have a sales team reporting to you, Right by default nobody trained me in sales they just had a sales team reporting and all i knew was i had to deliver some numbers right we had targets and i had this team that had to deliver those targets and because they rely on you on the guidance you have to read a lot so i read any sales book that i could find i read all the management books that i could find and the one book though that uh stood out for me on everything management that I did was the One Minute Manager by mm -hmm. Ken Blanchard. Yeah. And the reason for that is it assumes that every problem is solvable if you only take the time to look deep into it and to talk to people around you and to explore and observe that you are going to find a solution. And it does that in such a gentle way that you don't have to hit somebody in the head to get the results. And mm -hmm. so that was my favorite go-to. Go, 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 go to book tied with there is a book called by uh, Schwartz, I think is his name The Magic of Thinking Big mm -hmm. so combining these two things uh, going from an engineer to sales or to business management in general I decided that all of these things were if anybody else could do it so could I let me, right. let me ask in what capacity were you now having sales reporting to you even though you didn't it sounds to me like you hadn't even yet had a sales title at that particular point had you no i didn't i okay. i was a, i was the i was a division head and right. as the division head i had of course i had the p and l responsibility mm -hmm. right and what that means was i had a dedicated sales team that reported that that reported into me mm -hmm. i had a team of uh, 
sales engineers uh, that went out there and our selling at that time was very technical. It was extremely technical, which is not a good thing. Now, so in that case, I made quite a number of mistakes that I, <laughs> I, would, I would not make today because we had a product that was an engineered product and we sold it accordingly. There are, now I know that there are better ways of, of, of doing that. So then eventually what happened is that company was acquired. It was acquired. Some of the business got uh, taken out and integrated into other, acquired by Siemens. And so then I would take over. I was, just wasn't the department head as I had been before. So I took over the whole business for Siemens and I, and I drove that. That again came with its own sales team. It came with a diversity of products. So now I added more products to it than the one that I had before. And I would do this for seven years until I got so tired of being my own technical expert that I just wanted to run something where I was and sales was a logical thing. The company at that time had a sales challenge in one of the areas. And so I volunteered to go and solve it. Wow. So many things to ask there. Let me go back to, um, you know, the readings, reading of the book, uh, One Minute Manager. And right. the, the other one was, what was the other one you said? The magic of thinking big. Yeah, the magic of thinking big. When you think about hiring salespeople, right, from, from that point on, I, I assume you must think differently than a lot of sales leaders that I've interviewed and that I've talked to over the years about what you're looking for in a salesperson. Uh, tell me about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I said a moment ago that I made some mistakes that I wouldn't make again today. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was because the, when I got on board, my boss was, his uh, modus operandi was to go out and hire engineers to go and do the selling. And what we did was we really didn't train them very well on how to sell. And so they were engineers selling. So they would engineer uh, the product to death. And that was a problem. And because you are spending that much time engineering, so I, I, I took that over because you are spending that much time engineering the product. You don't have time to really articulate value. You don't have time to talk about the customer's problem. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, what we eventually would do is to dwell so much on the solution of the customer's problem that we ignored the fact that they have said, we want to keep this simple. <laughs> this has to run at it. And sometimes my guys will be insisting to the customer and say, hey, if you have this application, it is nasty, it is dusty. Mining, for example, it is dusty. You need this. Otherwise, your equipment is going to fail. But the customer had told us, don't do that. And we lost so much business insisting that. And so that raised alarm bells in my head where I said, this cannot be. The very first thing you have to do again, that is where I started thinking about the customer, the interest of the customer. You must understand what the customer is looking for and be able to adapt your solution to what the customer is asking for. Yes, we might have this equipment that uh, this area environment that is so uh, hostile, the customer knows that. They are the domain expert, right? So let's go in with what they are looking for. And once you are at the table, it makes it easier for you to be able to, add, to, to share some counsel. You cannot share some counsel when you are out from outside looking in because somebody else got the job. And frankly, our job is not to advise the customer. Our job is to go and sell, right? The company hired us to go and, uh, and, and develop business. And so let's develop business within a, in a manner that we do not put, bring unnecessary liability or risk to the company. Right, and you can cover some of these things with uh, simply with the legal language that you use in the, in the proposals or in the contracts. Yeah. In, as, as it pertains to targeting and looking for good potential salespeople on your team, candidates, right? Are you looking for people that have, so are you looking for people that have domain expertise or are you looking for people that have the ability to learn and adapt the way that you did with your own career. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks for bringing that back. I talked so much I didn't quite answer your question <laughs> earlier. <laughs> okay. the, the example that I just articulated led me to the point uh, that you do have to have people. There are things that you can teach, mm -hmm. right? So I went out and I started looking at uh, how do we all function? There are th I realized that there are things I can teach you. Mm -hmm. I can teach you about the product. 
I can teach you about the demands of the market. However, there are certain things that are very difficult to teach. Curiosity is one of them, right? Uh, as a sales guy, I think curiosity is the driver because it is that curiosity that forces me to want to know more about the customer, to want to know more about the market, right? And um, why is it that important? Because one of the things that we do, especially as salespeople, we say, yeah, I'm a good listener. But then you say one thing, the customer opens their mouth and you cannot wait for them to shut up so that you can tell the customer how great solutions you have, right? Which is another no-no. If you have been selling for a while that you do not, the customer doesn't say, I have this problem. And you say, hey, we got this great solution, right? You are cheapening your offering by doing that. You listen to the customer, you go away and you come back with an assemblage of solutions that can solve the customer's problem. So when I'm looking for people, curiosity is one of them. The second thing is coach, uh, coachability. I want people that I'm able to coach. This means people that are willing to learn, right? Uh, they, of course, must be able to work with others. And be an, an integrity is at the top is is that important as well. So these for me are the four things uh, that I think are extremely difficult to teach. And so when I'm recruiting, I look for these four things because everything else around the company, the business, the industry, I can teach. And then so okay, so that answers that uh, the, the next question, which is is that. If, if they don't have experience selling, let's say, connected devices or some sort of re related software, as long as they are showing those soft skills, if you will, coachability, curiosity, the ability to learn, um, you, can, you, 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 you can teach them the rest. Yeah. But frankly, uh, Jay, around across various sectors in software, in SaaS, for example, and so on, and so, I think we make too much of... Um, previous experience mm -hmm. in the industry. Yep. And the irony, of course, is if we are all going out and hiring people and demanding previous experience, where on earth is that experience going to come from? <laughs> right? You have somebody that has spent time in college or university and has learned. And, and my approach to, if you go to college or you went to the university, my approach there has always, my interpretation is you really didn't go to university to, to learn this particular thing that you did learn. You really go there to learn how to learn. And so the idea that somebody has a degree, it doesn't really matter in what they have the degree, it tells me that there are certain fundamentals that they will be able to, uh, to assimilate, understand very quickly and deploy. So that I can teach, right? The threats that really make somebody likable, that hard work, that curiosity that we're talking about, uh, you cannot do that. And so, no. I am of the opinion that when you are hiring, look for those threads that will make somebody successful, somebody that works, the rest that you can teach, you can teach. Because regardless, even if I'm coming from a similar background anyways, you are going to need to, you will need to do something because if I'm, if I come from, uh, if I'm going from, from Gong to Outreach, for example, they both sell software. The cultures are different. The approaches are different. The way that they go to market is different. So you are going to need to transition me. You are going to need to onboard me and teach me the way of one rather than the other anyways. So why put such an emphasis on that and sometimes lose potentially very good people? What's your approach to coaching and training? Like if I were to, you know, be onboarded at Honeywell, let's say, for instance, and, and sit on, and I'm on your team now or your team's team, even I know you have people that are reporting to you uh, as far as managers go, but what does that, what is your approach? Like, how do you actually get the best out of your people in terms of coach, train, motivate? In sales is tricky, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because quite often we don't have time. In sales, you do not have time to say, what am I, let's, let's, let's take it slow because you've got to deliver the numbers, right? Uh, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, as, especially as a frontline sales manager or a senior leader, for example, for, for that matter, you go on a sales call with somebody and you see a trend rate coming and we are all advised to let it happen. <laughs> but you are thinking of those numbers behind your head and you saying, I cannot, this is a million dollars, man. I got to, I, I got to, to secure this. But what I found is it really helps to, shut up and let all of that happen, right? And therefore, coaching 
uh, and I'm one of the, I'm an engineer, right? And this is a negative of the engineer. As an engineer, I'm trained to tell. Mm. I'm trained to tell that this is how you do things. Hey, this is a process. You do this, this, and this. Uh, I'm having a problem here. Okay, have you thought of this, this, and this? And I have had to really to work really hard to put that to the side when I'm coaching people, which is to ask questions around the situation in order to help you figure out, right? And I, I treat that the same as I treat customers. If I'm going to ask customers about their business, I also want to ask colleagues and my teammates about their business. So you are selling, you have a territory or you have a set of accounts, that is your business. Why are you doing what you are doing, right? And for me, the real uh, methodology there of coaching that I've found to work is the, the GROW method, right? What, are the, what, what is the goal or what were the goals that we set here? Mm -hmm that we you really wanted to accomplish. What is the reality? So if those were the goals, where do we stand now? What are the obstacles that we have seen? And uh, what's the way forward? Now that we see saw all of this, what are we going to do to be to address to get to the next step? And I've found that to work very well. What if when you're it's funny, when you when you have that approach when you're asking the questions, are you tempted to because I feel like in a lot of ways and I and I in this position myself, you know the answers and you're not getting the right answers, right? <laughs> or you're getting answers that are incongruent with the way that your rep should be thinking or the way that your manager is thinking. And you're chomping at the bit to prescribe it or tell them that, no, like that's crazy. <laughs> like You shouldn't be thinking that way. Like at what point do you, I guess, prescribe or inject the right way if you're not actually getting the right answers and usually it's almost like a, the way they're not thinking about the problem in the same way that you want them to be thinking about the problem right right that's that's an interesting question which points out to the dilemma of of coaching as a manager and therefore i think uh, as a manager you have two roles one of them is to manage another one is to lead and the coaching i put the coaching part under the leading and so as a manager, there are certain things in a process that you have established and those things are non-negotiable, right? So if as a company, you have defined a way of doing things that are non-negotiable, be clear about that. Don't try and put that as part of coaching. So be clear, this is what we do. I expect you to do X number of calls. That is non-negotiable, right? And then sort the things where you part of coaching again is to make sure that you as a leader do not end up owning the problem that the other person has, right? You want to give me my problem. You want to support me. Otherwise, you find me coming back to you over and over again with the same problem. And you are thinking, didn't we just talk about this yesterday? No, we didn't. Yesterday, you told me what to do. I went I, I, and I did it. I did not get the opportunity to reflect and think and come up with a solution myself, which is what coaching is all about. So if we can differentiate those two things, what are the things that I need to tell my team to do or my employee to do versus the things that I can help them grow and become independent? I think it makes that, uh, that, that easier. You mentioned in one of our previous conversations that you tend to not give up, right? That you, you, you just, that's in your nature. Um, at what point do you actually uh, give up? In this case, it might be you know, moving somebody out or maybe it's you know, something even bigger than that. But, um, and and do you, have you had examples, I guess, where you look back where you go, you know what, I held on to that one too long or I, I, that was a problem. I have a lot I, of them. <laughs> that was a problem that I tackled that, that I maybe should have given up a little bit sooner. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, I, uh, there, I can count a number of people that I held onto for just way too long, mm. right? In, in part, because it had taken me so long to recruit them. And I run a team across, uh, I run teams across Canada and the US. And some of them were in remote locations. And as I told you, these were very specialized products and sometimes it's difficult to find the people. So managing people remote and not seeing the results and after you had spent six, eight months to recruit them, can be daunting. And so, yes, I did hold on to some people for too long. 
But that was before I learned that uh, I could use coaching to help you grow and figure out if you really had what it takes, right? Because sometimes we make hiring mistakes and we simply need to own up to them and, uh, and cut it before it hurts so much. Now, when I, after I learned that, I give you an example of an employee that I had. I had hired this guy who had a lot of promise. And uh, we, we had a very good discussion of what we we're going to do, right? And typically, I was at the time saying, okay, guys, I need, if you are a salesperson, whether you have a territory or a set of accounts, I need you to come up with your business plan. If you know how to do that, great, do something. Come up with it. I'm not prescribing a template. If you don't know, then set up a meeting and I will uh, guide you. Or sometimes I didn't do that myself. I'll connect you with another colleague who had done something. I said, this guy, why don't you talk to him? Let him be your, your coach, your mentor in this case. And with this particular guy, we talked to the point where I then say, okay, I set up a bi-weekly cadence. Uh, so we identified, the, we are going to do this, 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 right? And then we will monitor. It was essentially a PIP. It was a performance improvement plan. And at the beginning of that, I said, I think you, from what I know, I th think that if you told me the truth and if what I see on your resume is true, you can do this. But I, I do not understand why we are having challenges, but I'm happy to work with you to help. And so we set a timeline. I think we gave ourselves about uh, three months or so. So we are going to work on this for two, three months. We'll meet bi-weekly. And each time we talk, you have homework. I need you completing that homework and coming back. So we did that. I don't think it got up to the end time because it simply, I wasn't seeing progress. So I let him go. And it was clear to him from the beginning that if uh, towards the end of this process, there was no progress, he would not be part of the team. So it was clear. And when you say no progress, was it behavior-based? Was it a skills gap? What was, what was the challenge there? There were a number of things that we're addressing here, but mainly it was the... I, I wouldn't say the, the skills gap because what we had was we had identified a number of uh, clients that he was going to go after. And we defined the various steps that he was going to take, right? Mm -hmm. We are going to build a list of contacts. We are going to then engage those contacts at this particular time to talk about their business. We are going to do X, Y, Z, right? And uh, if it works, we are going to say why we think it works. If it didn't work, we are going to be able to articulate why it did not work. Mm. And then we can talk about it and see if we can, if it worked, how can we leverage it further? If it didn't work, how can we remedy the situation with the next one, right? But week after week, he came with an excuse after excuse after excuse of what nothing was done. Again, not really looking for a hundred percent success, but looking for to say, oh, I did this. You know, based on what we discussed last time, this is these are the insights I got and this is how I applied it and these are the results. We just didn't have that. Hmm. Right. Let me talk to you about so we, that's obviously individual. One of the things that you mentioned on your LinkedIn profile, and we talked about it before, which is um, team building. When you think of a team, right? Are you thinking of it, when you, when you think of team building, is it holistic for you or is it just like, I need 10 people, I'm going to go hire 10 people? <laughs> you need 10 people and you go hire 10 people, you are in trouble for business. <laughs> <laughs> you first have to de de define how, why, why do you need the 10 people, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've found is onboarding is critically important. So I might need 10 people and I know that there are within, especially within the SaaS space, there are businesses that have awesome onboarding mechanisms to be able to onboard tens, if not hundreds of people at a time. If you have that type of a mechanism, then you are good. Just go out and hire the 10 people. But if you don't, uh, be careful with how many, make sure that you're hiring the right number of people that you can reasonably onboard. One of the most frustrating things I've found in business is we go out, hire people, we show them the desk, we give them the phone and say, go, go sell. It, it, it doesn't work like, don't do that. You are doing yourself and the, and the employee a disservice, right? You want to make sure that people, when they onboard, they love the environment that they chose to come to you. They could have gone elsewhere. 
So give them a foundation so that they can be successful. And that is going to, that means not just you, the hiring manager, but make sure that you also build a team, an onboarding body, a, a mentor who is not you. I know that's somebody else in management that can help handhold that person and guide them. Be clear that you have a plan that when somebody comes in, they are going to go through these steps, right? And each step you check and make sure it's, uh, I found it work. What, what works very well is if you can do that and then certify it as well, right? People love certificates. So if you can get me through a step and get to the point where you say, okay, now you are SDR class one, class two, and so on and so forth. That, that, that's awesome, right? So no, I would not just go out and hire 10 people. I would uh, make sure that I align the hiring of the 10 people with the capacity that we have to onboard people. Uh, also with the business, it could very well be that we say we plan for 2022 to hire 10 people. Right, but one of the conditions of that is we are going to hire the first three or five people and see progress because we need to be able to pay for those 10 people, right? And part of overall that is, uh, I also have seen people hire people without an idea of how long will it take before they start being productive, right? I know some people uh, that were hired and within months they are being asked to go and sell stuff which they simply are not ready to don't do that that discourages a new employee and frankly you are going to damage the image because you now force a new employee to show up in front of the customer and if they don't know what they are doing what do you think that's doing to the, to the reputation of the company right right and so let's take that first three or five when you know you're building a team of 10 or maybe larger um, right. are, are you considering as your adding people to the team as it pertains to team building people that have, let's say a skill set that may be able to project them into a leadership role or some sort of a team lead, because obviously, you know, as a manager, there's only so much bandwidth that, that you would have right in that case. Um, how are you, what's, what's your thought process there? Or is it just something that you hope happens organically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to hope that these things just happened. But you remember when I said I got tired of being my own uh, technical expert? Yeah. Uh, I learned a lesson back then that you must always have a succession plan. Hmm. I had been doing all of these things and doing about four jobs on my own that I didn't pay attention until I really wanted somebody that could take over from me. And so I ended up not finding a clone of myself that could take over. And so I had to split, I think I split that one into three different roles that somebody could take. So, and that the hiring at that time was brutal because I wanted out. And so if I interviewed somebody and they were not interested in leadership, then it didn't matter how wonderful they were. Technically, I wasn't interested. <laughs> right. right. So, that, but that was for my very selfish reasons because <laughs> I wanted out and I couldn't get out until I had a succession. So, no, I think that uh, one of the best functioning teams that I've seen are teams where the leader doesn't have the whole responsibility on their shoulder, right? There are so many different ways of uh, coaching and handholding people. And sometimes some of the advice is best given by a team member, actually, instead of, in, instead of the leader. And so when I hire people, the ability to be able to lead not just the ability, the interest. If you have imminent interest, that, that is also fine. But that's going to very much... Deep. Uh, if you are hiring people, another thing that I've also seen is people hire people at a same level. I think it's important to hire people that come in at different levels, right? Getting junior people and then be able to handhold and lead and coach them through the organization because you are going to have some people that are just great engineers and that's what they want. You are going to have people that are great salespeople and they don't want to be anything other than wonderful salespeople. In that case, I'm just insisting that we make sure you are the best salesperson you can be or the best engineer that you can be. So by opting to stay within a role is no excuse to not grow within that role, I'm saying. Yes. Right? So, so you need a blend of people. Because let's face it, you've got nothing to sell if you do not have wonderful engineers. <laughs> right. Right. So you mentioned cost in terms of the, you know, being able to pay for the team members that you're bringing on. 
when you're creating that succession plan, let's just say, right, to your point where you had to, uh, you couldn't clone yourself, so you needed to find, let's say, three people to to do all the things that you were doing. How does that, how how do you cost out that? I'm not even sure if I'm not saying that right, but how do you look at the cost of that? Because it's different than looking at a, a, a rep that has a number and you can quantify it pretty easily. When you're looking for someone who's a leader or a manager um, and they're not directly selling, how does that work? And what are the, I guess the, I don't know, the indicators there to say, okay, um, you know, this was worth the investment over a certain period of time, you know? Yeah. In that case, it's generally, it's, it's easier. Now that's an investment. And if I'm bringing in three people, I have to be able to figure out what the productivity is that they are going to bring. Mm -hmm. Right. So you are looking at the entire P&L. So what's the top line? What is our cost of goods sold or sales and admin, for example, depending on the role that this person has? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are our margin targets? If I can, if I'm bringing people like that and I can grow volume because I now have more people in the team, mm. right? How long is it going to take me to grow that? It, mm -hmm. Very well, it might happen that for half a year or so, I sacrifice a bit of margin to get people up and running. Or in, in my example of hiring three, it might also mean that I simply don't hire all the three at the same time. It might mean that I, I prioritize the roles, hire one, that does something, right? In my case, where when I did that, it was actually easier because the one of the three people that I hired was supposed to take over the technical leadership from me. And so uh, in Canada, we were a local organization. And so I got uh, headquarters too. They had him for a year. So I did not have the cost for a year. So you have to negotiate. <laughs> you have to look within the business and see who else can help you carry some of that cost, right? If that is it. And so by the time he came back after the year, he was very productive. And so I didn't have to sacrifice margin in order to onboard him. That's always a nice luxury uh, to have for sure. You know, um, let me ask you this then. So after six, let's let's just let's just say, for instance, it's it's six months, right? Where right. the uh, the you, you know you're sacrificing margin. Let's say for the first six months. After that six months, to your point about volume, should volume accelerate then at that point? In other words, if you're if you're if you were growing at say ten percent before, or I don't know whatever the number is, right? Now that this person or these people are in their seats volume or sales should accelerate overall, right? Because there's less of a bottleneck with just one person, right? Yes. Is, is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely fair to say. And we are talking to people that are selling tech. So growing 10% is uh, not acceptable. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but in established economies, growing 10% is awesome, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you are not doing this in isolation, right? You are doing this with the other plans, whether it is a product launch or whatever it is that, that you are doing. You are doing this in the case of in, in the tech world. You are doing this with the tools and the platforms that you are deploying and employing. You are doing this with, with the outreach or with the inbound uh, using the website or whatever it is that you are doing. So you are doing this in concert with others. Mm -hmm. And yes, so this is just one part of your waterfall columns to say this is a cost that I have on the one hand, but you also have to have other initiatives, sales stimulation initiatives that help bring, bring the volume up in order to be able to drive that. So if you are doing that without growing the business, uh, then you are in trouble and you are not helping yourself for the business anymore. So the effective consequence of that must be growth and preferably dramatic growth of the business. Fantastic. All right. I love it. I love and it. which in our case, which was that uh, mature economy, but this, this is what we did mm -hmm. because I, I, all of these things happened around the, around the dot-com bust mm -hmm. when the economy went, the financial crisis when the economy went real down. No, it wasn't a dot-com. It was a financial crisis. No doors too big to fail people that we had. <laughs> uh, it's around that. And most of my business was in one sector, oil and gas, which overnight 
uh, disappeared. And so we had to diversify the business. And the only reason I could, uh, the only way I could diversify that was because now I had these people, I had people to look after certain things that I had invested in. But we split and say, what new markets can we go after? And so we ended up finding ourselves in transportation and in a renewable wind that uh, gave us an explosion for two years that we hadn't seen before. Right. And, yeah. and it was oil and gas too. What you said, transportation and wind, is that what you said? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Public transit. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, we, we were selling, uh, we were selling um, transmission equipment. So we were selling gearboxes and, mm -hmm. and, and, and motors that went into industrial application. But because that was essentially done, I got an interest in municipal trans transit business and happened to have a product that we hadn't paid attention to. And so that became an obsession. And we won multi within two years, we, we had won more than $40 million of business, which was much more than the business that we were doing at the time. <laughs> That's amazing too, because when you increased your bandwidth because of what you had just said, then you were able to pay attention to think something that you weren't paying attention to. And as a result, um, the business grew a lot. And which speaks to what we talked about when you are hiring people or when you are leading and coaching people, which is um, how do they go to market? So you need to give them a focus mm. because wonderful things happen when you, when you have that focus. In this case, we divided the team and say, let's, let's go there, right? I'm going to take uh, trends. That's really what we're on streetcars and somebody else is going to take renewables and so on and so forth. Mm. And so we ended up uh, with these areas that uh, were very successful. Oh, man, that's so great. All right, fantastic. You ready for the final five I'm now calling it? I'm ready. All right, here we go. Do you have a philosophy or general approach to how you prioritize your time? <laughs> that's the one thing I don't think I'm, in, I'm ever going to learn the way I like to. <laughs> yes, but my, 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 my approach to time is the following. When, if you think of the, the 80-20 rule, which says that you are going to get 80% uh, of the results from 20% of the initiatives. I tend to apply that to my time a lot. What do I mean by that? I have, when I look at clients, depending on where we are, if there is an opportunity that is that we can drive within a particular time, I put a lot of effort and emphasis in that. Right, either to move the opportunity forward or to grow the contact base within the account. I will do that for a short time and then drive it. Once those relationships are established, then I can write slowly on that and, and move on. So my time gets allocated strictly around, that, around those bases. That's the first thing. But on a day-to-day -day basis, things still have to happen. So I do a lot of uh, time blocking where I go to the calendar and, and it's dangerous, especially when you go to a new place. You go to a new place, you want to talk to anybody that can talk to you. And, mm. and that happened to me uh, a number of times. You go there and all of a sudden, everybody, everybody else owns your calendar. And you start running like a chicken without a head. And so I quickly reverted. Once I now know enough people, I revert to time blocking, where I block time to do X. There's time that I block to do prospecting, time that I block to do project work and in between I have uh, spaces that people can put things on the calendar for. I have spaces where I can have internal discussions or I can allow customers to schedule meetings and things like that. Yep, that's what I've learned too uh, lately, which has been a game changer for me. Yeah. If I'm able to be disciplined about it. Um, <laughs> that, that is a key word, being yeah. disciplined about it. <laughs> For sure. Tell me about a setback you had and how you overcame it. Mm. That's a good and interesting question. I don't, I don't dwell a lot on setbacks. So I tend, I, I am, I'm a, I'm a rather positive guy. So I tend to not uh, think of uh, setbacks very much. Okay. But let's, 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 let's see if we cannot find one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, is that your final answer? Should I move on to the next one? <laughs> you know what? We'll come back to that one while you, while you, uh, yeah, while let's, you let's, let's come, let's come back to it. <laughs> yeah. While you pontificate about that one. Um, how do you manage stress or prevent stress from overcoming you? Mm. By not taking anything personal. Mm -hmm. The, 
we we are in the midst of a pandemic. I was going to say we are coming out of a pandemic. We are still right in the midst yeah. of it. And when this thing happened in 2020, we all found ourselves locked up for a while, right? And my approach to that was, well, like with many things, is there something, what I do is I take a situation and I look at it. Is there anything that I can control about this situation? If the answer is yes, what is it that I can control? Then I set about controlling that. If the answer is no, uh, then I realize that there is no need hitting myself against the wall about something that I absolutely cannot control. So I, I leave that as is and focus my attention on things that are within my control, things that I can do something to change. And that has helped me enormously. What do you want to get better at right now? <laughs> We're talking about time, right? <laughs> I, I, I really do need to make sure that I continue with my time. I do the time blocking, like you said. Mm. Then there is an interesting customer that comes along and I said, you know what? That prospecting can wait now. Let's put the customer meeting here. Yeah. I need to get a bit more disciplined at how I actually driving and, use, and, and using all of that. Yep. What are you most excited about right now? both personally and professionally? Oh, personally, I uh, happen to be in a state, I have th three kids and all of them happen to be in a very interesting space at the, at, the, at the moment. So I'm very excited to see how they will all grow. My daughter is a physician who is who has now been about a year and a half in residence uh, studying to be a radiologist. She still got another three and a half years at least to go. So I'm very excited about that. Then I have the middle one that just finished university. We are still negotiating whether he should go into sales or something else. <laughs> <laughs> or engineer. <laughs> or, or I, I don't think it would be engineering. He, is, uh, natural, he did biology, natural sciences. He did okay. biology, chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then I have the youngest one that just started university. So they are all in very interesting stages of their lives. Yeah. I'm very excited to see what uh, happens with them. Yeah. Uh, professionally, I think we are living in awesome times. We are living in times of such tremendous technological transformation. And so I'm very, very excited about the promise of digital transformation, Industry 4.0, whichever way you call it. We have seen that in our personal lives already. Right. Whether we are talking about uh, Amazon, Amazon's um, sales platform, whether we are talking about uh, the Netflixes of this world that we are seeing have disrupted businesses enormously. Manufacturing has been talking about it, but now we are beginning to get there. It's manufacturing. It is things like uh, power, supply, energy, the energy industry all types of public problems, societal problems that we have. And I'm really very excited about the promise that technology has to deliver when it comes to that. I think this is a wonderful time to be alive and to get involved. Yeah, you and I were talking about that um, in one of our previous conversations. It was just fascinating to hear your passion and enthusiasm for that. So um, very interesting. Going back to question number two now, <laughs> setback and how you overcame it. Or we can just wrap it up and no. Let let's 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 talk a bit. Of, let's talk a bit about that. One of the things, as a young person at the university, this might not be exact answer to your question, but I'm to talk about it anyways. As a young person, as a you you go whether you are going to university or college, you are learning something, and you think it's taking forever, right? I spent what five and a half years at a university to get a master's degree. And uh, I had so many opportunities to learn languages, and I love languages, right? The one that I think of is I could have learned Japanese or Mandarin at the university, but I didn't, right? Because I was always so busy and I wanted to get out. Now, when I look back and realize that I spent five and a half, six years at the university compared to the years that I've now been working, it tells me that that pales in comparison to anything. And that on its own helps give me quite a different perspective when it comes to time and when mm. it comes to hurrying. Mm. That there always is uh, something that you can benefit. It doesn't matter what it is that you learn. You always can leverage that uh, for some good in your life or in somebody else's life. Right? Yes. And so let's not miss opportunities. Yes. 
Okay. Yep, absolutely. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. It's fantastic. It's a great way to end it. Um, Barshu Kwaya, Kwaya, Kwaya. Right? Did I pronounce that right? Awesome. You did. You you did well. <laughs> we pre we we pretend the N is not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you for going <laughs> over quota. Thanks, Jay. Very nice to be here. Goodbye, everybody. Cue in the music. <laughs>